Bonnie was the first to disappear. She's my neighbour, Mr. Henderson's dog. An old collie. Mr. Henderson can be kind of grumpy, but I felt sorry for him when I saw him the other day. He was standing in front of our village notice board, shivering in the February cold, a frown on his face. The missing poster was clutched tight in his gloved hands, and he struggled to pin it in place as I approached him. Hey, Mr. Henderson. Even though I didn't raise my voice, Mr. Henderson jumped as if I'd shouted. He wore a big black coat and scarf. The breath puffed from his mouth in little white clouds. His hands were shaking as he maneuvered the poster, trying to line up the pin. He had a blown up photo of Bonnie in the middle, and the words, Have you seen this dog? centered across the top in red caps. Has Bonnie run off again? Mr. Henderson frowned down at me. There's no chuffing again about it. His Yorkshire accent came out thick and gruff. She's never bloody well ran off before in her life. Not my Bonnie. I knew this wasn't quite true. Bonnie once got off the lead and chased our dog, Duke, halfway around the village. But right then, it didn't seem like a good idea to contradict Mr. Henderson. His face was red with the cold, and the frown above his bloodshot eyes had deepened into a scowl. He finally finished pinning the poster in place and stepped back. His breath puffed out of his mouth as he stared at it. Something funny going on round here. He muttered the words at the corkboard notice without looking at me. I laid her out this morning, same as I do every day. She always comes back. My encounter with Mr. Henderson happened three days ago. No one has seen Bonnie since. My thoughts keep drifting back to Mr. Henderson the following day. I'm on half term at the moment and I've been tasked with walking Duke while my parents are off at work and all the way around our usual circuit, his words kept popping into my head. Something funny going on round here. I thought he might be right too. I don't know if it's the freezing weather, but there seems to be an atmosphere hanging over the village lately. People quieter, less friendly. A sort of smothering grey silence that blankets everything. I've been feeling it too, if I'm honest. A kind of background pressure behind the eyes. Ever since school broke up, I've had trouble sleeping. Headaches during the day. Bad dreams. I reckon I must be coming down with something. I actually felt like I had the beginnings of a migraine during the walk with Duke. So I was glad when she decided to cut our normal route short. Typically, we do a big circular lap of the fields and woods near our house. Start off along the main village road, then cut down a footpath, then wander through this little copse of trees. There's a huge oak at the centre I use as a halfway marker for our walk, before heading back along a different path. But today, Duke was having none of it. When we got to the fork in the path that leads towards the little copse, she began whining. It wouldn't go further. I tried to tug her along with the lead, but it was no good. Duke is a pretty big dog. She's a red setter slash Labrador mix, and if she doesn't want to go somewhere, there's no forcing her. I didn't take long to give up. By that point, the pressure behind my eyes felt like too sharp cold spikes and I was more than happy to get home. I had bad dreams that night. They're sort of fuzzy in my mind, like figures in a half fog, but I can still remember the gist. In the worst one, I was back on the walk with Duke, heading towards that same copse of trees. The weather was even worse in the dreams and it felt like we were struggling into a blizzard. Snow and wind buffeted us, and I had to keep my head down. The fog was so dense, I felt like we were inside a cloud. Suddenly, as we were reaching the fork leading up to the copse, leading towards the big oak tree at its centre, I felt the lead go limp in my hand. 
When I glanced to my left, Duke was gone. The next morning, I found out three more pets were missing. A cat and two other dogs. I learned this from some of the local kids. There's a group of us from the village that hang out every now and then. We all go to the same secondary school, but we're in different years and classes, so we don't talk to each other much on a day-to-day -day basis. But sometimes, when there's nothing else to do in the village, we all meet up. I found them that morning by a little stone bridge that cuts across a stream not far from my house. The water was frozen over, and they were skimming stones across the ice and daring each other to walk on the surface Three of them, two younger twins, Helen and Sadie, who were in year seven, and this kid in the year above me called Brian. They heard my footsteps crunching across the frozen grass and looked up as I approached. I nodded to them. Did you hear what happened? This was Sadie. She was bundled up in a dark blue puffer jacket with a hood pulled tight over her head. All I could see of her face were her wide eyes and red cheeks. Her sister, Helen, glanced quickly between the two of us. Sadie, don't. That's it, we were not meant to talk about it until he's spoken to the police. Sadie frowned back at her. Yeah, and he said we were meant to stay in the house while he's at work too, but you wanted to come outside and find people, remember? I took my hand under my armpits to protect them from the cold. I had a headache again. I didn't know if it was a bad dream or the fact that our house seems to be constantly freezing, but I felt like I barely slept. The girl's sure voices weren't helping either. What's going on? I directed the question at Brian, who hadn't said anything yet. He was perched on the metal railing that ran along the bridge, swinging his wellies underneath him as he stared back at me. Brian's a bit of a weird kid. He has flesh tubes in his ears, and he's always wearing death metal t-shirts, but I guess he's okay. Today, he was wearing a huge, black duffel coat that looked like it belonged to his dad. The thing hung off his skinny frame like a cape. Did you hear Mr. Henderson's dog went missing the other day? Brian had a stick in his hand that he tapped against the railing as he spoke. His brown eyes were large in his face, and he didn't wait for me to speak before continuing. We thought she'd just run off, but now it looks like something dodgy's going on. Sadie and Helen's cat didn't come in this morning, and Mum said Valerie from the house down by the church was calling out for a Scottish terriers earlier. They stay out in the garden overnight, you know, but apparently they weren't in their kennel when she got up. A blast of cold air blew through the trees. Leaves rustled around us. I shivered. A memory of Duke on the walk the other day came back into my mind. Duke whining and digging her feet in, not wanting to go any further. Was she okay at home? She'd been fine when I left the house. But right then, I was wondering if I'd remember to lock the front door. I'd have to go back soon anyway. My head was killing me, and the cold was making it worse. I hope Billy's okay. Sadie's voice shook. For a moment, I thought she might be on the verge of tears, but when I looked up, she was only staring, wide-eyed into the distance. You don't think anything's bad happened to him, do you, Helly? Brian spoke again before Helen could reply. I heard my parents talking before they left for work, and they reckon there's something weird going on. Maybe a big cat that got loose or something. He grinned and banged the stick on the railing harder. Four pets don't just go missing in two days. No way. Something has to be taking them. Brian, don't. If your dad's thinking of calling the police, he must know it too. Brian looked over at me and grinned. Weird stuff indeed. I've got this weird book at home about UFOs, and it says there's often a high number of animal disappearances in the area that have sightings. Alien sightings, I mean. Shut up, Brian. Helen's voice was like a spike going into my head. I turned around, without saying anything else, and began to walk away from them. Brian's voice drifted after me on the wind. That's right, Pete. Better get home quickly. Make sure they haven't got that mutt of yours yet.
that night, I had the worst dream yet. It felt like I was in a fever half the night, cold and shivery, unable to fall into a deep sleep, but unable to wake up either. I dreamt about the copse of trees again, the oak tree too. I was back in the blizzard, fighting to walk forward through the snow and wind. Grey shadows danced through the fog around me. I could see Duke. I tried calling out to her, but when I opened my mouth, I couldn't make a sound. Freezing air buffeted my face. I had a vague sense of trees around me, shadows stretching over the path above me like giant hands. After a while of struggling forward with my head down, I glanced up. Somewhere up ahead, half hidden in the fog, was the towering shape of the oak tree. The one Duke hadn't wanted to go near. And in my dream, wind howling around my face and cutting into my skin, I suddenly understood why. Because there was someone standing up there. A half-hidden figure in the fog. I couldn't make out any of their features, but I had the sense of a tall shadow next to the trunk. A shadow that seemed to be waiting for me. And from somewhere deep in my stomach and extending out into my frozen nerve endings, I felt the worst sense of dread I've ever felt before in my life. I tried to dig my feet in and stay put like Duke did, but the wind seemed to have changed direction. It carried me forward. That was last night. As I write this now, sitting at the computer in my room and trying to make sense of everything, that same sense of dread is still sitting in my stomach. It's like a knot that won't loosen. I'd hoped that when I finally woke up, thrashing in my rumpled duvet and cold with sweat, that the feeling would go away. It hasn't. It's grown. It grew when I saw the scattered leaves on the floor of my bedroom. It grew even more when I pulled back the covers and saw the dirt on my bed on the bottom of my feet too. I thought I'd stopped sleepwalking years ago, but it seems like last night's dream might not have been entirely my head after all. None of that was the worst thing though. The worst thing, the thing that prompted me to write this all down to try and make sense of it, the thing that makes me think I might be really, seriously ill, is the floorboard. The loose floorboard in the corner of my room. I noticed it as I was getting out of bed to go to the bathroom. It caught my eye because a leaf, presumably one brought back from my nighttime adventure, had lodged in the crack beside it. The board was slightly raised too, as if it had been lifted and not put back properly. Writing this now, I can see the floorboard from the corner of my eye. It's still raised, but I didn't push it all the way down after I looked under there. I wish I hadn't looked under there. My thoughts are a jumbled mess I still can't make sense of. But the items I found below that floorboard are pushing my mind in a direction I don't want it to go. The first thing I found was a map. It was badly drawn and I couldn't make much sense of the details. But the place being mapped out was obvious. My village. What was even more obvious was the large red cross marking the exact point on Duke's usual walk where the oak tree stands. The same one I saw in my dream. That was bad. But it wasn't the worst thing. The worst thing was the wooden box. The tiny jewellery box beneath the floorboard that jingled when I lifted it out and which contained nothing inside but a handful of dirt encrusted metal collar tags similar to the one on the collar Duke wears around her neck. Writing this now, I feel exhausted. My headaches raging again and I can barely keep my eyes open. But I don't want to close them. I'm scared of what might happen if I do. 
My parents will be home from work soon. I can't show them the box. I can't tell my friends, or family, or teachers about what I've found. They'll all think I've done something bad. And, despite what I keep trying to tell myself about this all being some sick joke, some horrible, impossible trick, I think they could be right. A frigid wind rushed through the fenced-in backyard, scraping across the top of the snow and making me shiver under the cold moon of night. The warmth I'd gained from the exertion of shoveling nearly a foot of snow had faded. The snow had a reflective glint from the light of the moon, fitting that as I continued building the snowman that reflected about things in my head. After all, my only company was my thoughts in the wintry night. I guess it could be said that the snowman I was crafting could have kept me company, but it is hard to relate to something so cold and lifeless. A fierce snowfall had affected our neighborhood over the past few days, and many of the usual snow clearing services were tied up with jobs bigger than a small neighborhood's driveways and roads. The snow had finally subsided, but I had made my way to my ungrateful ex-wife's house to shovel her driveway for the third time this week. Letting too much build up just made it too heavy. After what she put me through, you would think she could at least be thankful. But even that seemed too much to ask. When I arrived, she seemed barely awake and rudely told me to just get it done, like I was her slave and not doing this out of charity. That a man would even show up to help his ex-wife was rare, but to then treat him like that would be enough to send many men over the edge. I figured I would finish up at her house and move on to some other houses, maybe get some extra cash before the people in the morning woke up and tried to do the same. I was just getting ahead of the competition, but my snowman took precedence over that. My hands felt cold as I picked up more of the freshly fallen snow, carefully packed the last bit and stepped back to look at my creation. It was one of the greatest snowmen I had ever created, or maybe it is better to describe that one as a snowwoman since I had intended that one to be female, a mother in fact. When my daughter saw it in the morning, I knew she would be so excited. I'd even borrowed some of my ex-wife's clothes in order to make the snowwoman a little bit more familiar and motherly. A cool pink hat and scarf decorated the snowwoman, along with a carrot nose and button eyes, and some eyelashes to make it more feminine. I tried to add my own special touch with a lipstick that I hoped would make some definable lips, but the result was a smeared mess that was runny and distorted. The lips seemed to drip red, like blood oozing from a split lip in winter. It was not perfect, but I knew my daughter would love it when she awoke in the morning. My task was not yet complete though. Certainly, a snow woman would like to spend some time with someone to accompany her on these cold days. I had a second metal pole that sat nearby in the surrounding snow. I grabbed the metal pole and stood it upright next to the woman before pushing it down into the deep snow until it touched the hard, wintry ground. To get the metal pole down any further would require some sort of hammering that I could not afford to do at that moment. The deep snow held the pole firmly in place, just as it had done for the first pole that aided in creating the snow woman. I picked up my shovel and made my way out of the backyard as quietly as I could. The next stop was the gentleman's house across the road, and I only say gentleman loosely. Randy was his name, a trucker fellow who wasn't home a lot, though the snow had kept him in this time. Randy was your typical big mouth know-it-all, the kind of guy who'd always end up in a fight at the bar. 
I was sure he would want his driveway shoveled though. In fact, I'd shoveled his place many times in the past out of generosity. A bit of anger flared up in me as I reflected about the day I found him, lying with my now ex-wife. It was the catalyst for our divorce two years ago, and Randy and I were not on good terms. But I would offer to shovel his driveway anyway. It was a sort of peace offering that I'd hoped he would take. I rang his doorbell twice, and there was no answer. Still, I was sure he wanted his driveway shoveled, so I persisted in pressing that doorbell until at last Randy came to the door. He nearly pulled the door off its hinges, he was so angry, but it didn't faze me. Randy's face was red with rage, and he was dressed in a t-shirt and shorts. It was clear he was in bed for the night, and that I disturbed him. My hand rested in my pocket, just waiting for my moment. It's the middle of the night, what the hell are you doing here Chris? He yelled. I'm just here to shovel your driveway. I said, shovel my driveway? You woke me up for this? What the hell is wrong with you? No wonder your wife... I didn't need to hear him finish that sentence. In one fluid motion, I pulled the syringe from my pocket and stabbed it into his neck. I pushed down on the plunger, and the paralyzing toxin quickly transferred to his bloodstream. His eyes went wide with shock, and I pushed him back onto the floor before stepping inside his house and closing the door behind me. Randy twitched on the floor as I bent down next to him. He tried to talk, but his words were nothing but a slur. I laughed at his feeble attempts to move, but already the toxin was taking effect and his actions were uncoordinated and weak. Soon he would be paralyzed, a prisoner in his own body. At least, he would be, for as long as the toxin took hold of him. Don't worry, pal. It's not going to kill you. Hang tight for a bit. I laughed. As if you have a choice, but hey, I'll shovel your driveway for you, so that's one thing you won't have to worry about. I said, and then left him there on the floor as I went to take care of his driveway. Warmth returned as I worked. Each scoop of snow seemed to relieve my stress and frustrations and keep me warm against the cold winds. There was something therapeutic about shoveling snow then, but what was even more therapeutic was making the snowmen, which I was ready to do once again. I went back inside Randy's house and saw him lying there on the floor. His eyes were wide with fear and I could see the toxin had taken full effect. He was conscious. His eyes were able to follow me, but the rest of his body was limp and useless. Next, there was the difficult part of getting him across the street. I tried to pick him up and carry him, but he was far too heavy. Essentially, he was dead weight, and I figured it would be easier to just drag him by his legs, but even that was rigorous, though not impossible. I ended up pulling him across the street by his legs in the dead of night. The people in the surrounding houses none the wiser. His face was pulled through the rough snow, and I'm sure it would hurt like hell if he could have felt it. By the time I finished dragging him, his face was bloody and had begun to puff up. I had dragged him right up to that metal pole that rested in the snow before I had to stop and take a breather. When I had caught my breath, I pulled Randy up to his knees and then pushed him towards the metal pole until his back rested against it, his legs splayed out behind him. Getting him to keep his back straight took a lot of effort, much more than the snow woman. Randy's body would continuously slump down and I would have to pull him back up until I got him securely tied to the pole and in the perfect position. His skin was already turning blue from the cold. Frostbite had taken over much of his body. I took a few moments to walk around him and make sure every rope was secure. 
Randy's eyes followed me when I was in front of him. I just wanted to shovel your driveway. You didn't have to be so damn rude, I said. Randy's eyes went wide, and I could see that fear had now evolved into terror. I think he recognized his mistake, but it was too late now for him. I had to build a snowman, and nothing was going to stop me. I carefully picked up some snow and started packing it around Randy's legs and feet. Most people just lazily roll snowballs and stack them together, often creating a misshapen nightmare of a snowman that will fall over in two hours. I was using a metal pole and a dirt bag trucker, so my first step was to get enough snow packed around his feet and legs first, and then I go through the art of molding that first large ball of snow that will cover the lower half of his body. I had to shape the snowball methodically, carefully packing the snow into a rounded form. It took a lot of time, but I'd eventually pack together the largest snowball around Randy's lower body. The first snowball came to rest at about his stomach area. His eyes changed from terror to absolute defeat as I started to pack snow around his chest and back to start forming the second part of the snowman. I thought Randy must have known that, even if he did escape somehow, his body had been ravaged by frostbite, his limbs would surely have to be amputated, and if they could save him, he would have to undergo hellish skin grafts that would leave him a nightmarish pain for weeks and months, maybe even years. The time ticked by as I packed and packed the frigid snow. Randy was in and out of consciousness, still paralyzed by the toxin. At last, the second rounded figure took form, and Randy was buried in snow up to his head. Randy took one last look at me, a look of pleading in his eyes, but that was not going to work on me. I guess he was not as smart as I took him for earlier. This was the merciful path at this point, and besides, I had a snowman to finish. Nobody was going to stop me. The first bit of snow I packed went into his eyes, and then around his chin, and up to his mouth. Before long, Randy was covered in the cold snow that sealed his fate, and the snowman was almost complete. The last and most important thing to do was to customize the snowman. After all, it's only three snowballs if you don't add some extra features. I needed something for a hat, so I made my way back over to Randy's house. Cracking open his door, I made my way inside, tracking wet, slushy snow throughout his house. I'm sure he would not mind me borrowing some things of his after I shoveled his driveway for him. I searched his closet, and what a mess it was. Piles of lewd magazines sat atop a bunch of piles of clothes that I guess he had been too lazy to hang up. Judging by the number of hangers that hung with no clothes on them. As I went to move the magazine, a couple of pictures fell out. Looking through them, I could see they were pictures of my ex-wife. Though one picture in particular stood out. It was a photo of my then pregnant wife. Randy stood beside her with a large smile and a hand on her belly. I took a deep breath and then tossed the picture to the ground. This was not surprising to me in the least. I had already caught them in the act, but the picture seemed to show their affair had been going on for a long time. I tossed the rest of the pictures aside and checked the pile of clothes. I found a brilliant red tie that would work perfectly. It even matched the color of lipstick on the snow woman. I needed a nice hat though, and I knew that he would not own a top hat. So, I found a regular black winter hat that I figured would do the trick. I made my way back to the snowman and put the tie around its neck, and the hat went onto its head. A couple of button eyes and a carrot nose later, and I now had a beautiful snow couple that my daughter would love when she saw it in the morning. The dark of night was already starting to break 
and the sun was fast rising. I sat on the ground, cradling my legs and trying to keep warm by rocking back and forth. Eventually, I fell asleep for a few moments, but came to and saw the snow couple still standing before me with joyful smiles on their faces. The sun had risen, and it was time for my daughter to see these masterpieces. I made my way out of the gated backyard and trudged up the front steps of the house before ringing the doorbell. I rang it three times and waited and waited with nervous excitement. Eventually, I rang it again and the door finally opened. My daughter stood at the door, groggily, her hair frazzled and all over the place from sleep. Daddy, what are you doing here? Where's mom? She asked me. Hey, sweetie. Daddy is here because I shoveled the driveway. But I've got a big surprise for you in the backyard. You should get dressed and come outside, I said. Her eyes lit up when I said surprise. They always do. Any sort of tiredness that still lingered in her seemed to disappear as she ran upstairs to get dressed, yelling in excitement about a surprise on the way up. When she came outside, she grabbed my hand and nearly pulled me towards the backyard. But I stopped her and said she had to close her eyes before we opened the gate. She closed her eyes and I unlatched the gate and directed her inside until she was just a few feet from the snow couple. With her eyes shut and breathing in anticipation. Okay, sweetie. Go ahead. Open your eyes. I said. She opened her eyes, and I could see the excitement in her face grow. She had a great smile as she looked at the snow couple in awe. She remained speechless as she walked around them, almost inspecting them, and then came back to me and gave me a great big hug. Well, what do you think? They're a nice couple, aren't they? I asked. They're so perfect, she said with a gleam in her eye, and she turned around to look at the snowman again. But I think there's something missing. I rested my hand on her shoulders. Oh, what's that? There needs to be a snow baby too. They should have a kid. I laughed and reached into my pocket. I had another syringe ready to go. You know, I was thinking the same thing. I said as I stabbed the syringe full of the paralyzing toxin into her neck. She turned around and gave me the oddest look I've ever seen as she fell to the ground and looked up at me with confusion. I could see the resemblance to Randy now. They both had that dumbfounded look when I stabbed them. She was trying to talk, but I soothed her. Don't worry, sweetie. You just lay there for a bit. Daddy needs to get a new pole and do some shoveling. I'll be back after I shovel a bit. I'll be back after I shovel a bit. And we'll make that kid snowman. There's no worse feeling than unexpectedly stepping into two inches of cold, dirty bath water. That's how the morning started. I was expecting to take a hot shower, but instead found myself standing in a puddle of water. Cassidy, you blocked the drain again! I jumped out of the tub and wiped my feet on the bath mat with disgust. I reached for the plumber snake which was always on hand for exactly this reason. This happened a lot, more than usual lately. I cursed under my breath. I eased the snake into the drain. I knew exactly what I'd find. A big, slimy ball of hair. Cassidy stood in the doorway behind me. She shuffled in that cute, apologetic way she always did when I had to unclog the drain. I wasn't mad at her, of course. Not really. 
I just really, really hated having to unclog the drain. Sorry, Dolan. I pulled some gunk out last night. I guess there was more than I thought. If you're not pulling out a wet cat, it's not enough. I was joking, of course. Not really. I glanced at her over my shoulder, and from her apologetic smile, I knew she could tell. It wasn't her fault, but it was hard not to feel frustrated. I'll make breakfast this morning, she volunteered, trying to make it up to me. She didn't have to, but I still appreciated the gesture. I was a grumpy bugger, but I loved her. Bacon? I smiled at her, and she smiled back. When I asked my friends what it was like to live with their girlfriends, they all had one grievance in common. Hair. Hair everywhere. I thought they were exaggerating, but they really weren't. Of course, I love Cassidy enough to overlook something so petty. Usually. Not at 6am though. At first, as the truth ran through more lint rollers than I could count, I thought it was funny and perplexing. How? How did she shed so much? Why wasn't she bald? Cassidy's long, curly black hair was one of the many things that attracted me to her in the first place. Living with her, I had a new appreciation for all the work that went into her looks. What I couldn't understand was how her hair ended up where it did. Wrapped around my toes. Hell, I've pulled a strand out of my butt crack. Apparently, I'm not the only guy either. What the heck? It's part of the beautiful girlfriend package, right? A seemingly universal grievance. I could tolerate most of it. Pulling her hair out of the lint trap. Cutting her hair out of the vacuum brush roll. Hell, I could even tolerate replacing the vacuum every six months like clockwork. What I couldn't stand was the hair clogs in the bathtub. Intellectually, I know that hair isn't disgusting the second it leaves your head. But it is disgusting after it sits in a drain collecting whatever nasty slime that washes away in the shower. No matter how many times I've done it, which is a lot. Unclogging the drain is the most revolting chore in the world. I'd rather do anything else. Once I felt resistance, I began to rotate the snake slowly. My stomach roiled with anticipation of what I was going to fish out. Apparently, this one was a monster of a clog, because I didn't feel the auger head break through that mess. When I tried to pull the clog out, the snake didn't budge. In fact, the clog seemed to retreat deeper into the pipe. Before I even realized what was happening, I found myself yanked forward, my head smashed against the shower tile, and I let out an angry yell of pain. Cassidy heard the commotion. She came running in, wide-eyed. She found me holding my head in my hands, still needing a moment to recover. Dolan, are you okay? Did you slip? A little dazed, I nodded. I guess I had slipped. Or something. I wasn't entirely sure. But I didn't want to worry her about it. It's really lodged in there. I think I accidentally pushed it in deeper though. I already had a headache. Well... She looked pale, but smiled through a worry for me. You should probably get dressed and go to the doctor, just in case. I looked down at myself, remembering I was naked. Oh yeah, it looked like I wasn't getting my morning shower after all. Nah, I don't need to go to the doctor for a bump. It's not that bad. It's not like I was knocked unconscious. You can't be too careful with head injuries, Cassidy persisted. If I get symptoms beside a headache and a bruise, I'll go in. I brushed her off. Don't worry, I added, swooping in to give her a quick kiss. I'm not an idiot. You kind of are, she laughed, but I could tell she was still tense. She was a warrior. You're not burning breakfast, are you? 
that would be a real emergency. Oh, um, I'll go check that. I watch the dash back out of the bathroom, heading back to the kitchen. Hopefully the bacon will be spared. Maybe my morning could still be salvaged. Chuckling to myself, I reach down into the tub to retrieve the snake, only to find that it wasn't there. Okay, that had never happened before. Now I had to figure out how to get a snake out of the pipe too. I tried sticking my finger in so I could feel around for it, but my fingers were too thick. I felt a slimy film, but nothing else. Alrighty then, I straightened up, standing there for a moment. I shook my head in disbelief, about to give up on my morning, when I heard a strange, metallic banging sound. It moved along the floor, with a hissing sound of water. At least, I thought it was water. If I had to call a plumber, I was going to be mad. I wasn't the most handy, but I tried to fix it myself first. I washed my hands, got dressed then headed into the kitchen. The eggs were ruined, but the bacon wasn't. The hash browns looked extra crispy, but I actually liked them that way. Cassidy's cheeks were a little pink from embarrassment. Cute. Breakfast looks great, I beamed, hoping she knew I wasn't mad. At least not at her. I was trying not to show my frustration, because I knew it stressed her out, even if it wasn't directed at her. Are you going to stay home today? She asked with concern. Yeah, I can't go in if I haven't showered anyway. I didn't really want to miss work, but taking care of the plumbing was pretty important. Plus, I had a headache and wanted to monitor my head injury, just in case. She made me a plate, then joined me at the table. Normally, I did the cooking, because I enjoyed it, but it was really nice to have a cook for me now and then. Breakfast always tastes better when you're not the one who made it. Sorry about the drain. I really did try and fix it last night, she explained. It happens. This one's extra bad, apparently. If I couldn't get it out with a snake, you definitely couldn't, I assured her. We might even need a plumber, I added. But that's a last resort, if I have anything to say about it. You still love me, right? She batted her eyelashes at me. I couldn't help but laugh. It'll take more than a hairball to tear us apart. After breakfast, I went to the store to pick up some baking soda, vinegar, and another plumber snake. I grabbed a Drano too, just in case, though I tried to avoid using chemicals and roll pipes as much as I could. I mixed together one quarter a cup each baking soda and vinegar, dumping the concoction directly into the drain. The standing water was grey and foul-smelling, but most of it had drained away slowly. I noticed an odd gurgling sound coming from the pipes, which I hoped was a good sign. I left the tub, giving the baking soda and vinegar an hour to cut through the gunk. I went to lie down, waiting for my headache to go away. Cassidy had the day off, so I listened to her putter around the house. She poked her head in the room to check on me after a while. Can I shower? She asked. Yeah, it's time to flush everything down with hot water anyway. I'm sure it's fine. I closed my eyes. Come get me when you're done. I need to try and get the other snake out. It fell in? I guess. It seemed more like it got pulled in, but that didn't really make sense. Some weird accident of physics, like an air bubble or water pressure, probably made it seem that way. I'll take care of it. Come get me when you're done. She nodded and came in to give me a quick kiss. Okay, love you. Love you more, I winked. Maybe I'll join you in a minute, actually. I still need a shower too. Well, you know where I'll be. I watched her go, enjoying the view and seriously considering going after her. After a moment, I heard the soft shh of the shower going. 
Cassidy hummed a cheerful tune I didn't recognize. I closed my eyes, smiling. I was about to drift off to sleep, but I was jolted awake by a sudden, sharp scream and a loud bang. Cassidy? I threw off the covers and flew down the hall. I burst into the bathroom, finding Cassidy holding the back of her head. Her face was the color of sour milk, and she was visibly shaking. The tub she was in was filled with filthy grey water. It smelled so bad I gagged. Hell, vomit smelled better than that putrid slop. Cassidy was sobbing in horror and disgust, but I couldn't tell if she was seriously hurt. You okay? I managed to keep myself from puking long enough to ask. N no, all this water just exploded out. It knocked me into the wall. I could see a film of slime and debris drifting sluggishly across the surface of the water. I shuddered, but pushed back my revulsion so I could help her. It's okay. You're okay, I said in as soothing a voice I could manage. I reached out, guiding her out of the tub carefully. Her legs were coated with the contents of the tub. I felt her almost slip. I steadied her carefully in my arms, only letting go when she had solid footing. I handed her a towel, pinching my nose. Something moved in the corner of my eye, something dark and writhing. It looked like something black and oily was oozing out of the drain and into the filthy water, but I couldn't see what it was through the cloudy liquid. Had the clog come bursting out of the drain somehow? I'm going to call a plumber. One sec. And a doctor? I trailed off, looking at her for verification. She shook her head. No, I'm fine. I'm just startled and grossed out. You and me both, I agreed, still pinching my nose. Whatever this problem was, it was way out of my depth. I left Cassidy to make the call while she leaned over the tub, looking at the water with repulsed fascination. I found my phone by the bedside table, still holding back bile. Before I could even make the call, she screamed again. This time, her cry was abruptly cut off, sounding muffled. That wasn't right. I hurried back, finding Cassidy on the bathroom floor. Her mouth was wide open, but something black and slimy was jammed between her lips. Her fingers kept trying to catch hold of whatever it was, but it wouldn't budge. It was hair. Without hesitation, I grabbed onto the slimy tangle and tried to pull it out of her mouth. She was trying to scream. She just couldn't. The whole hairy mass was wriggling and pulsing like it was a living thing. For some reason, it was trying to jam itself deeper down her throat. I couldn't get a solid grip. It felt wiry and slippery, scraping my hands that couldn't get a firm hold. Cassidy's eyes were wide with terror and fear, her face going red as she struggled to breathe. Despite my best efforts, the hairball jammed itself completely down her throat, taking my fingernails with it. My bloody fingertips followed the thing into her mouth, but I couldn't get a hold of it. My girlfriend was still choking, her dark eyes losing focus. I didn't know what to do. I called for an ambulance, frantically trying to explain what had happened. They didn't understand a word I said, but help was on its way. Cassidy was blue. I spotted the unopened drain snake I'd bought, and had a horrible idea. I tore it open quickly, and after a moment of hesitation, I pushed it down her throat. Whatever it was, I could see the lump it created in her throat. I yanked, trying to pull it back out. I only managed to pull out a few black strands. Whatever this thing was, 
It was impenetrable. Please, 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 I begged, though I don't know who I was begging. Cassidy? God? The hairball in her throat? I tried again, using a little more force. Again, I only succeeded in pulling out a few clumps of hair. I couldn't unclog her throat. Black curls covered the slime stuck to her trembling chin, protruding from her mouth like tentacles. No, 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 this isn't happening. The paramedics broke down the door some time later. I hadn't heard them arrive. I hadn't heard anything but the roaring panic in my eyes and the gurgles coming from Cassidy's throat. I could hear the thing hissing like a feral rat. The paramedics found me with a plumber snake in hand. I was still bent over Cassidy's prone form, trying to stab the auger into the heart of the hairball so I could pull it out of her. I must have looked deranged. One of them forcibly pulled me away from her. I cried trying to get back to her, still screaming her name. I watched in horror as they stabbed a hole for her to breathe through. I tried to explain that I'd only used the snake as a last ditch effort to save her, but I don't think they believed me. The rest of that time is a blur. Police were called and Cassidy was taken away on a stretcher. Fortunately, the doctors were able to surgically remove the massive knot of hair, but they saw nothing unusual about it, aside from the size and the fact that they found it split up between my girlfriend's throat and stomach. Cassidy is in a coma. She's in bad shape, but she's breathing. I'm grateful for that. There's still hope. I haven't been charged with the crime. Yet. It's coming. The investigators are putting a case against me together, trying to figure out what happened. I know how it looks though. They think I'm an abuser. Looking back, I can see why they think that. The police asked if I was mad at my girlfriend for clogging the drain. They think I did this to her, jamming the hair down her throat in a fit of rage. That's ridiculous. I love her. I'd never hurt her over anything so stupid. Maybe it was annoying sometimes, but I never truly blamed her. Unfortunately, Cassidy can't tell them they're wrong. The hospital won't let me see her either. Her family thinks I'm responsible too. We're not married, so I can't force my way in. I'm sure a restraining order will be issued with the warrant. I don't know how to convince a jury that my insane story about a killer hairball is true. The only person who can prove it might never wake up. Cassidy, please wake up. We've been talking about it for weeks. Camping. Well, my daughter had, I should say. Personally, I was kind of on the fence. I'm not really an outdoorsy kind of guy, to put it mildly. If you'd asked if I'd ever pitched the tent, I'd probably just slap my thigh and giggle uncontrollably. Moving into a new house is a strenuous task in and of itself. But add starting a new job, a new life into the mix and you end up with one adult who doesn't know how to calm down, relax or spend time with his daughter. So that's where the camping idea originated. I promised her we'd go once we'd settled in and she made damn sure to hold me to it, reminding me of it at least five times daily. Melissa was a hurricane, always up to something. Some would call her a handful, but that would be nothing short of a gross understatement. But she was also sweet, dedicated, focused, and extremely imaginative. That's why it was so easy to sometimes forget I was the adult. She would mostly just take care of and entertain herself. But camping definitely required at least one adult. That's what I read somewhere anyway. And I was planning to go through with it, 
I swear. But alas, I can't control the weather. It started already Thursday afternoon. Pouring rain and strong winds. We, or she, were planning on heading out Saturday morning. But when we woke up, it had gotten even worse. Now, I'm no weatherman, but the weatherman on the local news is. Thus, I was inclined to believe him when he claimed we were dealing with a storm. Melissa was devastated, of course. She'd been really looking forward to it, picking out possible locations for our campsite, reading up on the flora and fauna of the area, learning what animals we might encounter. When I told her there was no way we could go camping in a storm, she broke down crying. I don't think she was mad at me, but it still broke my heart. So, that's when I proposed that we could set up camp right here in our living room. At first, she found the idea stupid. How could that be any fun? No animals, no fishing, no searching for remedial herbs, nothing. But she slowly came round to the idea. We could turn off all the lights, sleep in the tent, read scary stories, pig out on junk food. We could pretend we were lost campers in a storm and that something terrible lurked just outside our tents. So we pitched the tent right there between the couch and the TV, laid out the sleeping bags, emptied the cabinets and the cupboards for all things sweet, killed the lights, and crawled into our cosy little campsite universe. She brought a favourite book, Little Pumpkin and Cold Bones by Manon Lysette, while I was quite looking forward to reading this weird little book I'd found under a loose floorboard in the attic, The Electric Boner by some guy named Nathaniel Lewis. The pages were oddly sticky, but... What can you do? We snuggled up in our sleeping bags and had a great time, listening to the creepy creaking of the old house, the ghostly, banshee-like sounds of the wind, eating snacks, and telling each other scary stories. Her scared the hell out of me, let me tell you. She read to me from a book, and I read to her from my book. Not a good idea. And it was just wonderful. She fell asleep pretty late, face down in a book and popcorn. I guess I followed soon after. I think it was the cold that woke me up. That was the first thing I remember anyway. Freezing cold. Way below zero, crippling cold. I was shivering and chopping my teeth uncontrollably. The sleeping bag barely warm enough to keep me from going hypothermic. What the hell was going on? It was dark. Way too dark. Sure, we'd switched off almost all of the lights, but I was sure I left at least a few of them on. Had the power gone out? Given the intensity of the storm, it was entirely possible. But it still didn't explain the cold. I sat up clumsily, still constrained by a rather tight-fitting sleeping bag. There was something off, something I couldn't explain. Melissa, I whispered. No answer. Melissa, I said slightly louder. Are you there? Wake up. I got my arm free and blindly felt around the tent. Nothing. Not even her sleeping bag. Maybe she was uncomfortable, couldn't sleep, and decided to go to her bed. Maybe she just had to use the toilet and took the sleeping bag with her for warmth. I guess both made sense, but I still couldn't shake that strange feeling. The feeling that told me I wasn't in my house anymore. I fumbled to find the zipper. My fingers were completely numb from the cold, and I had to pause every once in a while to breathe some warmth back into them. When I finally found it, without thinking, I just yanked it open, not considering what I might face on the other side. Snow. 
No wonder it was so dark. The tent was completely covered in snow. I managed to crawl out awkwardly, a groaning sense of dread slowly revealing itself as I realized just how far from the house I had to be. I stumbled to my feet, looking around at my newfound location dumbfoundedly. It was amazing, unreal, and absolutely terrifying. It was dark, but not too dark. Dusky or dim, I guess. But the full moon in the clear sky above illuminated just about everything. I was standing in what appeared to be a deep ravine, and the steep, jagged rock walls stretching impossibly into the air on either side. The ground was covered in about two feet of snow, and I could see the slope curving even deeper ahead. But what really caught my eye, the thing that instantly sent adrenaline pumping through my system, was the footprints in the snow. They were leading further down the slope. Two distinct sets of footprints. One were boot prints, obviously adult, a male, probably judging by the size. The other, a naked footprints of a child. Melissa, it had to be her. Without thinking, I immediately sprung to action and halfway ran, halfway stumbled through the snow, calling out her name in shrieks of utter panic. Melissa! Melissa! The only thing I could hear was my own echoing voice. I kept going, the cold not bothering me as much, probably because of the previously mentioned adrenaline, but I knew deep down I wouldn't last long in these temperatures. I followed the footprints for about five minutes, when I spotted blood. Just tiny droplets in the snow to begin with, but growing in both size and frequency the further I went. She was hurt. The sick asshole that was chasing her had hurt her. I felt a kind of mixture between horror and fear and rage that completely possessed me, and driven by this terrible emotion, I set aside all pain and exhaustion, running at speeds I've yet to match. And then, I found them. It was sort of a circular chamber, the end of the slope. The moonlight hit them just right, and it felt like I was watching everything unfold in some crazy hallucination. She didn't wear any clothes. She was completely stark, and her pale skin appeared almost blue. She had a back turned to me, her flowing hair reaching down to her waist. Melissa! I yelled. The girl turned around slowly. She was bathed in blood head to foot, and in her cold, blue eyes, I saw something disturbingly primal, something dark and animalistic, and it hit me like a ton of bricks. That wasn't Melissa. She sniffed the air, like she was trying to ascertain if I was a threat or not before bending down to the mangled corpse before her. What happened next, I still have problems describing. It was like watching a clan of hyenas rip their prey to pieces, except in this case, the hyenas was just a tiny, fair-haired girl. I couldn't move. I didn't want to move. I think maybe I was afraid she'd react to any sudden movement. Afraid she'd chase me down and kill me like she did that man. After about ten minutes of watching her completely shred the corpse to tiny chunks, she took a long, deep breath of the freezing cold air and turned back to face me. Have you seen Miss Piggy? she asked. The bad man scared her. The voice was so normal, exactly what you'd expect from a little girl, but 
it still struck fear in my heart. Terrible, agonizing dread. N no, I mumbled. No, I haven't seen Miss Piggy. She stared at me for quite a while, her thin arms sort of waving hypnotically at her side. Every once in a while, she broke out snarling like an agitated dog, almost as if she wasn't fond of her own thoughts. You better go then, she eventually said. Go back home. I stood there, shivering, suddenly realizing again just how cold it really was. The girl didn't seem to mind the sub zero temperature at all. She just kept pacing around what was left of the corpse, occasionally erupting in wild, bestial snarls. Go! She suddenly shrieked. Go before I change my mind! I turned on a dime and ran back the way I came. I didn't stop. Didn't even slow down to catch brief glances behind me. I just knew that I had to do what she said. If I didn't, she'd slaughter me without breaking a sweat. I arrived at the tent, wheezing, completely famished, exhausted, dehydrated, and dangerously hypothermic, all mixed into one big bag of things that could kill me. What now, was all I could think. What on earth should I do now? It was only when I heard the rapidly increasing sounds of naked feet in the snow that I dove back into the tent, feverishly closing the zipper behind me. I don't know how long I stayed there. Hours, days, probably not days. But at some point, I just lost consciousness, fainted, everything turned black. I woke up in my living room, well, in a tent erected in my living room at the very least. This is the part you loathe, the part some of you were expecting, the part where I tell you. It was all a dream. Well, that's what I tried to tell myself anyway. Just some freakishly vivid dream. So vivid, in fact, that I woke up with frostbite on my hands and feet. Melissa was sound asleep next to me, and I think to all the gods I can remember the name of, at least she didn't get dragged into this terrifying nightmare. As I sat there, tending to my wounds, she slowly came to and sat up next to me. She gave me a long hug. You are right, kiddo? I asked. Yeah, daddy, I just wanted to thank you. Thank me for what? I said, slightly perplexed. For the camping trip, of course. It was wonderful. I smiled. It had been pretty great. Well, except for that very vivid nightmare. But I was alive, and my daughter was happy. What more can a man ask for? Guess what? She said playfully. What? I smiled. I got to ride her. She smiled gleefully. What? Who? I asked, puzzled. Miss Piggy, of course. The girl thanked me for finding her, and she let me ride her. I'm never going camping in my living room again. Ever been in love? That burning emotion of passion, one that surges through your soul, able to transcend all of time itself. That feeling you think can last forever, only to be shut down by the harsh fist of reality. The shattering dread that fills you for months, years after it ends, be it due to drama, distance or death. What if you could make a single moment of bliss last forever? To be united with your soulmate for the rest of eternity. Would you take that chance? 
or would you let it slip through your fingers, like I did? I was given the chance of forever, but now I'm doomed to live out my days, eventually die, and be washed away by the marching passage of time, while she is one with the bleeding tree, flesh stripped from her bones as she's nurturing the ever-growing forest, suffering until the end of days. It was our seven-year anniversary, and I'd promised Jen the perfect date. As we were both avid hikers, I figured a getaway picnic in a secluded spot, miles away from any other sentient being, would be ideal. Together, we travelled on every trail, camped in every forest, and climbed each mountain within a hundred mile radius, which of course, made it difficult to find a new, romantic spot anywhere nearby. But, after asking around on different forums, and getting advice from some of our travelling buddies, I finally learned about a place only a three hour drive away from our city, a decently desolated forest named Mooreswood, which had very few trails, a hidden wonder of nature, which was exactly what we needed. One afternoon, a couple of days before our anniversary, I drove out myself to scout the area. I had taken the day off work without telling Jen to set off my secret mission. I walked through the forest, marking trees with orange cloth as I made my way, hoping I'd randomly stumble upon a body of water, maybe a clearing to set up a blanket and enjoy the sun. The forest ran wild with life, birds emerging from each tree as I walked past, curious to the new creature that had invaded their home, walking around on two legs with no wings. Through the trees, I could see a clearing in the forest, separated by a thick wall of thorny bushes. No sign of anyone ever wandering through. So, I lay down on my knees and crawled my way through, cutting myself on the thorns in the process, but it was worth it. On the other side, I found a clear, open space, only decorated by a lake and a single tree on the other side standing tall with branches spreading out so thick it provided a perfect parasol of cover against the midday sun. It was perfect. After a quick survey of the area, I decided to dig a small hole under the tree, digging down a casket containing a bottle of wine alongside any non-perishable food. The picnic would be a surprise and its end would bring out the true anniversary gift, an engagement ring. Nothing too impressive, just a silver band with a half carat diamond. Still, something I had been saving up towards for the better part of a year, being in our late twenties and all, young but determined, ready for the commitment. The next two days passed at a snail's pace, waiting for the day to arrive waking up at the break of dawn. We had a system where we each had our turn at arranging our anniversary date, and this year, it was my chance to impress. Last date, she'd taken me for a weekend trip up a mountain, and now I aimed to make it a day to remember for the rest of our lives. We drove the almost 200 miles away from our city towards Mooreswood, before quickly making our way through the dense forest. It was the peak time for birds mating calls, joyfully greeting us as we wandered through, enjoying the sun rising above the tree line. Deers had just started walking up, jumping curiously through the trees to inspect their new guest. Admittedly, I got a tad lost on the way, with a few of the cloth pieces having fallen off the trees. I was in the lead, trying to guide, and didn't want to admit my inadequacy. Walking a few yards ahead, I stumbled upon a dead deer in our path. It was bizarre, half buried in the ground, half the flesh torn from its body. No smell, 
so it couldn't have been there for very long. Yet it seemed so... rotten. Before Jen could see it, I admitted that we'd gone off the path, and as soon as she realized we were off track, we just retraced our steps and quickly found our way again. Somewhere around ten, we found the thick wall of bushes and crawled through. I'd created a decently sized hole during my previous visit, ensuring that Jen wouldn't get hurt on the thorns. A nasty cut would be a huge turn off for any date. There it was. The perfect spot. Even more delightfully idyllic in the glimmering morning light, reflecting on the dewdrops covering the leaves. So, what do you think? I asked. Oh, wow. It's unbelievable. How did you find this place? Trade secret. I would tell you, but then I'd have to kill you, I joked. I'm sure I can find a way to extract that information later, she said as she winked at me. We'd brought a picnic basket with bread, spreads, and a freshly made salad. Nothing too fancy. But Jen still didn't know about the hidden stash I'd put away under the tree. Hey, what's this? Jen said as she pointed to a heart-shaped red balloon stuck under one of the tree branches. Beneath it hung a string, with an envelope attached to it. Jen jumped up and pulled it down, carefully detaching the envelope and tying the balloon around her wrist to stop it from floating away. Ah, that's so sweet. You didn't have to, she said as she opened the envelope, pulling out a handwritten letter. Jen, I didn't. I tried to explain, but she had already started reading. She quickly realized I had nothing to do with the letter, when her face turned from joy to disappointment. But she shook away a frown and returned to her gleeful self. I guess someone found this place before you, she giggled as she began reading the letter out loud. Dear Sandra, you wouldn't believe a place like this could exist. Undiscovered and hidden from the rest of civilization. It's so beautiful. A secret garden of Eden. And the best part is that I just found it on accident. I bought you this balloon for your birthday. I wanted to tell you in person that I love you, but I guess I'm a coward. I realized we haven't told each other that yet, but I figured it would fit better here, by the clear crystal lake and the wonderful wildlife, especially the ducks. But I can't leave. There'll be excellent food for the bleeding tree. I know how much you like ducks, but when I found this place, the tree was dying, and it wasn't strong enough to consume me. But if I feed it the ducks, the rabbits, whatever other wildlife inhabits this area, I can finally merge with it and become one with the forest. I wish I could have taken you here, but I've already planted the seed within me, and if I leave, the seed will die. I'll attach this letter to the balloon and hope it finds you. Maybe you can come here and join me. The bleeding tree needs our flesh to live. Love, Jack. Jen handed me the letter, with a confused look on her face. Um, I think I must have misread something. That didn't really make any sense. I took the letter and skimmed over it. The handwriting was fairly unintelligible from the get-go, but it only got worse as it went on, and my dyslexic eyes could hardly decipher it. Jen had always been the one to translate doctor's notes and anything written in cursive. Despite my slow deciphering, it seemed correct. The bleeding tree needs our flesh to live that's unsettling have you ever heard about the bleeding tree i asked our town had quite a few legends urban tales and various myths but nothing like this jen shook her head still looking confused and mildly worried it's 
Probably a prank, right? She asked. Yeah, yeah, it has to be. What else? I said, before pointing to the balloon. And these healing balloons deflate after like, a day, right? So someone had to have put it there recently. Sure, but why? She had a point. In the most secluded forest in our area, a place that seemed untouched by mankind, why would anyone plant a balloon with a fake note? Unless they followed me. And even then, who would wander for hours just to prank someone? How about we just eat? I asked. I'm sure the balloon got caught in the wind or something, then somehow ended up stuck under this tree. Probably wasn't even meant for us, right? She nodded, and we decided to prepare our picnic date. We started with the sandwiches and salad, and I decided to keep the wine a secret until the end of the date, where I'd pour a glass at sunset and propose with a ring before we fell asleep under the stars. We ate, talked about a future we could only dream about, full of travel, adventures, free from traditional work and adult responsibilities, made futile plans about how we could make enough money to disappear off the face of the earth for a few years. We were dreamers, but that's how we liked it. Always talking about impossible things, some not even remotely grounded in reality. Jen took a knife out of our picnic basket and decided we should write our initials into the tree to be remembered for the next few decades. Do you want to do it? She asked. I grabbed the knife and cut in R plus J. I lay down on the ground and stared up at the tree above. There was a small hole in the otherwise continuous ceiling of leaves and beyond it hung a brilliant blue sky an infinite cover for the secrets of the universe my mind wondered and i pondered all the possibilities of the world which triggered a conversation we'd had a thousand times before wouldn't it be cool if we could just live forever i said rhetorically not expecting an answer you don't want to live forever, Jen responded, as if it were a fact. Well, maybe not forever, but imagine a couple of thousand years to explore. Trust me, you'll get bored. You can't even finish a movie in one sitting. That's different. I wouldn't get bored of this. Honestly, I could do this until the end of time, I argued. It's not different. An eternity is by definition boring. Imagine having solved all the mysteries in the world, having thought every possible thought, seen every part of every planet. What do you do next? So, you wouldn't want more time? Nope. Life is beautiful exactly because it's fleeting. It could vanish in a second, meaning we're forced to enjoy it as much as we can. Infinite life would just let us procrastinate finding happiness forever. The discussion went on like that for a while, like it had before, and like it most likely would in the future. As we finished up the salad, I scanned around for the patch of freshly dug dirt, thinking I should start planning the next stage in our date. To my surprise, there were no disturbed parts of the ground, Everything had been grown over, seemingly untouched. I'd lost my secret hiding spot, and panic started to rise in my blood. You are right. You look a bit worried, Jen asked. Yeah, I just... I'm going to go for a little walk, digest all the food and all. Want to come with? Nah, I think I'll just lie here and write she responded. Jen pulled out her journal and started writing about a day. She always preferred to relax after a meal, but I had to think, and thought that maybe I could remember where I put the stash if I walked around the area, but I needed to be subtle. 
it was an oddly quiet afternoon, and though the sun stood high up in the sky, it was almost cold. That, in addition to the lack of animals surrounding the lake, felt wrong. I pulled out the letter again, and read over the part about the lake being filled with ducks, and about animals that surrounded it. Animals that would feed the bleeding tree. Then, I saw something that contrasted starkly with the clear water and the smooth rocks beneath it, shattering the monotonous glimmer. Something white, long sticks littering the lake floor. They were bones. From what I could tell, they mostly seemed like birds' rib cages, and maybe some foxes or other small animals, but a few larger, too large to come from any animal that lived in the forest. I took off my shoes to wade in the shallow water, picking up the largest one. A femur, based on what I could tell, almost looked like it belonged to a human being. Oh my god! I heard Jen yell from the tree. I ran over, not understanding what she was yelling about, until I stepped in something wet, just next to the tree. I looked down at my feet, to see a crimson liquid seeping up between my toes. What the hell? I said, realising all too late, I was standing in a pool of blood. Th there, she stuttered as she pointed at the tree we'd had our picnic beneath. A pool of dirty blood had gathered around the tree in my absence. The bark where we'd etched in our names had fallen off, and blood emerged from the hole. It was bleeding profusely, bright red liquid flowing out from the tree and mixing with the mud below. What the hell? Is the tree... I trailed off. It can't be blood. It has to be something else. Jen picked up a long stick and started prodding the bleeding hole. Jen, don't. That's disgusting. I said, but she'd already shoved the stick deeper into it. The entire tree twitched in reaction, as if filled with muscles, all contracting, trying to avoid the pain of being cut. Jen stepped back in shock, but quickly prodded the tree again to confirm we hadn't just gone crazy. Her second prod caused a larger chunk of bark to fall off the tree, revealing pulsating, red flesh beneath it. Let's get out of- I tried to say, but was interrupted by the tree starting to violently shake, pulling up flesh-covered roots from the dirt, causing the ground beneath us to shatter into pieces. Within a second- a large cap formed under our feet, causing us to crash into a pitch black hole below. As we tumbled, we reached out our hands for each other, but with no control, we could only hope to soften the blow. But, instead of landing safely, I hit my head on a rock sticking out from the wall. Then, I passed out. Once I finally awoke again, it felt like hours had passed. It had turned pitch black in the time I was out, and the only thing letting me know that I hadn't died was the sound of Jen moaning somewhere next to me. I fumbled around for my phone. It had fallen out of my pocket and landed in another pool of blood. I checked myself to see if I was the one bleeding, but apart from what must have been a mild concussion, I was unscathed. The phone still worked, and even without any service, it still functioned as a weak flashlight. I dimly lit up the surrounding cave and revealed a ceiling of dirt and meat above me. It wasn't night. There simply wasn't a sky to light up anything. Jen lay up against the wall, passed out from the fall. I shined my light at her and almost dropped my phone in shock. She'd been gutted by a sharp root sticking out from the ground, perforating straight through her abdomen. Jen, please, 
please wake up. I cried as I gently shook her, careful not to worsen her injury. She slowly opened her eyes and yelped in pain. What? What happened? She asked. Just lie still, Jen. We fell into the ground. You're... You're hurt. She moved her arms and quickly realized there was a branch sticking out from her belly. Oh my god, get it out, please, get it out, she cried as she tried pulling at the root. It twitched violently in response, putting Jen into further agony. Jen, you gotta keep still, please, if you move, you'll only make it worse. But it hurts, it hurts so much, she groaned. I know, I know, but please don't. I... I'm going to find help. We're going to get you out of here. I promise. Just stay still. She grabbed my hands as I tried to stand up. Wait, don't leave. I don't want to be alone. I'm not leaving you. I just need to look for a way out. I swung the flashlight around the cave, checking for any hole in the ceiling. Any possible way we could have fallen in. But the only way seemed to extend deeper into the ground. A small tunnel digging further into the darkness. The entire ground felt muddy in a mixture between dirt, blood, and the occasional fleshy root sticking up, wriggling around as it looked for us. Each root bled, adding to the pool that slowly filled the cave. Jen, there's no way to climb out of here. I have to check out the tunnel, I said. No, stay. It's not so bad. It's nice. Stay together, she mumbled, drifting in and out of consciousness, delirious from blood loss. I'm sorry, Jen. I have to find help, I said, kissing her on the forehead one last time. I lay down and started to slowly wriggle my way through the dark tunnel. For each inch I moved, I felt another root reach out, trying to grab me. Something white stuck out from the wall ahead, a fractured bone, sharp enough to cut through my flesh as I moved past it. I yelped quietly in pain, feeling warm blood trickling down my arm. As I bled, the root seemed to extend towards me, desperately trying to grab a hold of my newly formed wound, digging themselves inside. The pain was unbearable, but I pulled them out before they got a chance to fester. The cave opened up into a larger cavern, my weak flashlight doing little to illuminate it. I stood up slowly, almost tripping over while entering, as my foot got caught on something stuck to the ground. It was an arm, half buried in the ground, half digested by its surroundings, only a few pieces of fat and muscle still attached. There were hundreds of mangled bodies scattered around the cavern alongside various personal effects, phones, glasses, shoes, clothes, backpacks. A flashlight lay next to one of the less digested bodies, beside a wallet and something more familiar a bottle of wine, and a ring box. It was the casket I'd buried in preparation for the date. It had fallen down and shattered on a rock, spilling its contents. I pocketed the ring and picked up the flashlight. The wallet lay open on the ground, and I caught a glimpse of the name on the driver's license. It belonged to Jack Geller. Perhaps... It was even the one who wrote the letter we'd found earlier. There was another piece of paper inside the wallet, covered in the same illegible handwriting as before. Dear Sandra, I know this letter won't reach you, because I'm already joined with the bleeding tree, slowly becoming one with the eternal forest above. I wish you were here with me to comfort me through the pain. I hope it ends soon, but if not, well, each root in this place is made from a different person. 
travelers that got lost in the woods that have become integrated with the hive mind and very soon I'll be one of them too I can already hear their thoughts only whispers but they're getting louder soon I'll know what they're saying even now as I write oh god no this isn't what I wanted please no don't I'm sorry I'm sorry I'm sorry I'm sorry his letter ended abruptly with scribbles making no sense I checked around among his other possessions I found a knife and a small shovel then it dawned on me that he hadn't fallen into a trap like we had but instead he'd actively dug his way down looking for a route to join him with a tree if he could get in then maybe we could get out I grabbed his belongings and started crawling back once more cutting myself on the bone unable to avoid it I didn't care about the wounds I was determined to get Jen out of there to bring her back safely even if it killed me Jen had awoken by the time I returned but the root had grown in size wrapping around splitting up into smaller tendrils that actively dug into a chest even bulging through a skin I bent down ready to cut away the fleshy roots but she grabbed my hand before I could start she stared into my eyes pleading for me to stop what I was about to do Jen come on I know it'll hurt but I have to cut you loose I said tears welling up in my eyes she just looked back at me and I could see the pain she was suffering from I pulled out the little box I'd hidden in my pocket and opened it revealing the ring I I was going to but I sobbed unable to bring out the words I'd practiced for so long before our anniversary I just hoped she'd understand it and be distracted enough so I could cut the roots then she finally spoke it's nice here what stay with me let's just stay here she said her voice tired and completely rid of any emotion tears ran down my face but she no longer cared she wouldn't let me free her you'll die if you stay here Jen please I begged no nothing dies here nothing is allowed to she smiled revealing tiny roots extending from her mouth the tree had completely filled her even if I tried to cut her free she'd still be riddled with the things no 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 I'm getting you the hell out of here I yelled I held her arms down and lifted my knife against one of the roots it was surprisingly sharp considering how old it looked it easily cut through one of the smaller roots penetrating Jen's chest she writhed in agony as the connection severed blood spurting out of the stump of the root a hollow tube sticking into her chest it was her blood she had become so intertwined with the tree that killing the roots meant taking Jen with it Jen's smile vanished and she started crying why are you hurting me stop it I don't want to die I don't want to she sobbed then I did something I'll regret to the end of my days I had the choice between killing the love of my life or letting her become one with the bleeding tree maybe I'm weak maybe I'm a coward but I couldn't take a life I just couldn't so instead I took the shovel and started digging I left Jen alone in the dark while I fought for my freedom 
For each inch of dirt I removed, more roots, tendrils revealed themselves, reaching out in an attempt at digging themselves into my bleeding flesh. Another bone, another cut, but I kept going, digging with my spade and cutting with a knife, desperate to see the sunlight once more. I can't say for sure what happened next. It's all hazy, in a mixture between blood loss and adrenaline surging through my veins. But I remember hitting through the dirt, a ray of moonlight greeting me on the surface, and minutes of crawling away from the bleeding tree to safety. Despite my severe injuries, I made it to my feet, continuously bleeding as I limped my way towards the car. I dropped my phone somewhere while digging, and only had the moon to guide me through the dark, silent forest. Everything seemed grey in the lack of light, and then, at some point along my escape, I collapsed. That was two months ago. Since then, I've been in the hospital, in and out of a coma. The doctors tell me I suffered septic shock, apparently a reoccurring infection keeping me at bay until last week, when I finally awoke. They called it a miracle, but it doesn't feel like one. I left the cave to find help, to stop the tree from consuming Jen, but by now, her flesh has been torn from her bones, and I can only imagine she's one with it, to suffer for all eternity. I couldn't save her from an eternity of pain. It's my fault. This is my goodbye. No one should suffer the same fate Jen did, and yet I'm going back. I should have killed her before she got consumed by the roots. But now, I can do nothing more than to join her. I'm going back. At least she won't have to suffer alone. I don't drive at night anymore. At least, I don't drive anywhere that isn't very well illuminated. I know that sounds silly. Trust me when I say that my friends tease me to no end about it. They're the types that love going for late night cruises out around the outskirts of town to go stargazing. Both activities I used to enjoy. That was, until that one night. After that, I couldn't bring myself out of the light ever again. It was about a year ago in late July. I was living in a small town at the time in northern Alberta, staying there to get the most out of the cheap community college and low rent. I had just finished my finals and was looking forward to visiting family out west for my week-long vacation. It wasn't exactly a short trip, a total of four hours at least, just to even get to the next town over. To get to where my parents were, was an additional six hours of travel. Driving through Alberta isn't exactly exciting either. Not unless you enjoy wide open spaces and a lot of empty fields at least. It was about 4am when I got into my car. The bright idea to leave early that I had had the previous night was now leaving me bleary eyed and full of regret. I headed over to the closest gas station and stocked up on the usual road trip supplies energy drinks, chips, pretty much anything that looked good at the time. The coffee I'd brought with me was starting to kick in and I began to look forward to at least the initial first few hours of the trip. That was typically how it was with long car rides for me. The first few hours were great and relaxing, with the rest of the trip just slowly getting worse as I got those fun cramps or stiffness in the body from sitting too long. Before heading out of the city, I checked my phone, queuing up my playlist of music that would be keeping me company and double checking my route out of the city on Google Maps. Damn, a red bar sat halfway between me and where I was heading. Construction ahead. Expected delay, 
45 minutes. Great. That was just my luck that the main road itself was getting worked on, but there wasn't anything I could really do about that. Finally, pulling out of the gas station, I headed out, starting my long journey. The music pulsed through the speakers as the light pollution of the city slowly faded behind me and the night sky grew even brighter. It was a full moon out tonight, and one that complemented a sea of stars quite nicely too. That helped raise my mood up a bit, and I soon got lost in thought as I cruised down that dark road. After about an hour of driving down the open highway, the sky seemed to quickly darken, the moon becoming obscured, and the illuminated planes around me fading away to an inky black. The only thing that was visible now outside of my headlights were different twinkling lights off the horizon and the city lights far behind still in my rearview mirror. The lights ahead pulsed between orange and red with the occasional flash of a vehicle's headlights. That had to have been construction, I figured. It was another joy of driving out in these flat areas. You were able to see practically a full hour ahead of you in advance and just really taken all the excitement. At night, without the moon's glow, it was a much different feeling than boring though. It kind of felt like you were driving through space itself. A massive black expanse all around you, with only the different bits of lights off in the distance showing any real signs of life, almost as though the night sky itself had dripped down and enveloped the ground below. I cursed and shielded my eyes as someone passed me with a set of far too bright to be legal headlights, night vision being lost immediately. By the time I could actually see again, thankfully having not flown off the road, everything that wasn't in my headlights was just pitch black now. The edges of my car's headlight beams didn't seem to extend very far out either. Because of this, I almost missed a pair of cars that were off to the side of the road hazard lights going on and off to try to warn me in advance. I slowed my vehicle to try to get a better look in case they needed any help, but as I passed by, I didn't see anyone in the vehicles themselves. Neither car appeared to be damaged either. Weird. Maybe the owners had car problems and had hitched the ride back to town until a tow truck could come and retrieve the vehicles. I couldn't really give much of a better guess than that, so I continued on, not wanting to rub a neck any more than I already had. The darkness at this point had become rather oppressive. I noticed that outside of my beams of light, it was now just a solid black wall. Like, it just cut off immediately, with no glow or anything. I had to slow my speed to half just to be safe. While I tried my best to stay in the road, I must have completely forgotten about the construction zone. For when an orange pylon appeared out of the darkness, I hit the brakes. I must have missed the warning signs due to the weird blackout, but this had to have been the start of the construction zone. With due diligence, I crawled through the area, trying to catch a sign of any worker, or really, any signs of life. That was when I realized that there should have been some kind of life around here. I had already seen the lights on further back down the road, but now, as I drove through, there wasn't a single piece of equipment that seemed to be turned on in any way. Excavators sat abandoned, doors wide open, without an operator inside. Any floodlights had been knocked over or otherwise turned off in some other manner. However, things quickly went south from there. About halfway through was when I saw someone finally. A prone body lay face down on the side of the road, only half of the person visible from my car. I stopped the vehicle, wondering what he was doing at first, as it looked like he had his ear to the ground. Eventually, I realized that he must have been unconscious, so I put the car in park, 
turning on my phone's flashlight and the car interior light before getting out to add as much extra light as I could to the area. The moment I stepped out of the car, I could feel a very stark difference in the air. It was supposed to be the middle of the summer, yet I could almost see my breath. It was freezing out here for some reason. Hey buddy, you okay? I called out nervously, voice holding an odd echo to it that had no right to be there. I shine my flashlight over him as it got closer before quickly stumbling back. Jesus Christ! I practically sprinted back to my car, throwing myself inside and slamming the door behind me. Panicking to find the lock button, my fingers hit it and I tried to stop myself from hyperventilating. The lower half of that man's body had been eaten. Past this stomach, there was nothing more than bits of gore and viscera that had been strewn out across the road. It looked like something had just ripped into him and left the rest to rot. I pulled out my phone and tried to call 911, but I had no bars. I must have been too far out to get any signal. It wasn't like I could do anything to help the poor man from here, so I pulled the car out of park and continued out of the construction site. I spotted a few more bodies in varying condition as I tried to make my way out. That was when I saw it. Just as I turned a corner, my headlights illuminated something that was hunched over another construction worker. It almost looked like a person, but it was far too dark. It was incredibly thin, spine jutting out from its back as it initially faced away. When it turned in response to the light, it covered its malformed face with a massive hand that ended in sharp, ragged claws. Pinprick white eyes glaring at me from the shadows of its hand as it let out a shriek and bounded off into the darkness. At that point, I slammed my foot down on the gas and floored it out of there, having to swerve once or twice to avoid the abandoned equipment. Eventually, I rocketed out of the sight going far too fast, but unable to slow down. In my rearview mirror, I could see them, a collection of white eyes that trailed along behind me in the distance. They didn't make any sound, but I could tell they were getting closer, little by little. I must have had at least some luck that night, as when I made my way over the next hill, I could see off in the distance a gas station that was still lit up, a beacon of light in the sea of darkness that surrounded me. I managed to get to it in only a few minutes, my tires screeching across the pavement as I came to a halt directly under the gas area. The darkness was like a wall all around it, but I had a clear path to get inside of the building. Taking a deep breath, I escaped my vehicle and sprinted up to the glass door. When I got to it, the attendant inside was already unlocking it and pressing a button on the side to power it on, letting it open enough to get me in before he closed it again with a lock in place. Are you alright? He asked me as I stumbled away from the door, trying to put distance between me and the numerous windows that covered the front wall of the station. I felt vulnerable. There, in that little store, the panes of glass being the only thing between us and all that darkness outside, just waiting for the lights to go out. I started to try and explain to him what I had seen. When outside, the bulbs began to blow one by one around the top of the gas station, and the darkness encroaching closer and closer until it pressed up against the window. The light that was inside didn't seem to phase it at all now. Almost as soon as it had reached the glass, I could see them again. Small sets of white eyes dipping in and out of the darkness. 
What the hell is going on? Lieutenant cried in a panic as he too backed away from the glass. That was when we saw the first crack appear on the window, the tip of a clawed hand pressing into the glass as it singed underneath the bits of light that reached it. I don't know, just help me barricade this, I shouted back to him before shoving the shelves towards the front of the store. The glass held long enough for us to get a sort of half wall set up, but I knew it wouldn't hold them back forever. Turning to him, I asked, Is there a security room or somewhere else we can go to hide in here? He nodded, saying, In the back room. It's small but should fit us both. We got into the security room and shut the door, sliding the heavy lock into place before setting it. The room was small, but well illuminated. A row of six TV screens showing different camera angles from around the building. Four of them were completely blacked out, with only two that were inside of the store itself. One was positioned in the main lobby, and the second was pointed just outside the door. Only a few minutes after we had entered the security room did the front windows shatter. We only got to see a couple of seconds, but we watched the shelves get pushed aside and the inside go completely black. Now, all of the cameras were dark, and when the single bulb above us started to flicker, I turned on my phone's flashlight just in case. Luckily, the power didn't go out in this room at least, the door being sealed along the bottom as well, so there wasn't any crack for whatever this thing was to filter in through. We sat there in silence, neither of us brave enough to break it in fear of attracting unwanted attention. That silence broke at the first sound of scratching, which eventually led to a chorus of low whispers just outside of her door. They sounded just like normal people. And if it wasn't for what I had already seen, I might have thought that we were being rescued. But their voices were too low. And underneath their pleas for us to come out, I could get the sense of danger just on the edges of it. Like, if we didn't comply, there would be consequences. I don't know how long we were forced to sit there and listen to the scratching and whispers. The TV monitors would come on though, one by one, as the darkness seemed to recede. The sky, a pool of red and orange that signaled sunrise. We waited until the sun was well above the horizon, before opening the door slowly and taking our first steps outside. The store was trashed. Glass everywhere, along with what looked like hundreds of footprints that had trampled across the merchandise. My car appeared untouched, and I got it running again after the police arrived to aid the attendant. I still don't know what I saw that night. I don't think I ever will. But I think that's for the best. As, as there are some things that should probably stay in the darkness. Hey, you look just like me. Huh? I turned around. There was a man behind me in line at the coffee shop. He pointed at his shirt. Oh yeah, I'm wearing a red shirt too. <laughs> I forced a laugh. I turned around. It was my turn to order. Doppelgangers, we look alike, you and me, the man said again. I looked at him. He really didn't look like me. He was an inch shorter maybe, and he had a combed flat haircut like a ten-year-old's, but he had the same general build as me. We were probably the same age, and we were wearing the exact same clothes and shoes. He even had the same type of messenger bag. I imitated his dopey smile, hoping to appease him. I really didn't want to talk to anyone. Yeah, twinsies, 
I turned around and ordered my ice dirty chai. I went over to the pickup counter to wait. I'll have an ice dirty chai too. Oh no, seriously? He stood next to me at the pickup counter, still grinning. He was standing too close to me. It was strange. I could almost feel a kind of pressure or radiation coming off his body. It was like he had some sort of film of hot air an inch away from his skin. He kept whispering, twinsies, twinsies. Look, man, I said. Don't take this the wrong way, but you're really making me uncomfortable right now. I'm going to have to ask you to back off. It was like taking a toy away from a child. The man had the saddest expression I'd ever seen. There wasn't a trace of anger in it. Just hunched shoulders and a big, pouty frown, and his eyebrows scrunched up like a cartoon character's. Both our drinks were ready at the same time. I took mine, and he took his. For some reason, I made eye contact with him. Then he threw his cup on the floor. I just barely managed to make it to my class on time after I had run home to change my chai-soaked clothes. The manager had yelled at both of us. He seemed to think it was some kind of prank the two of us worked on together. Look, these knuckleheads even dressed alike. I sat down at the back of the lecture hall. I was still too mad to focus on my professor. So, while I pretended to take notes, I checked the neighbor bulletin. My neighborhood had its own little message board called Neighbor Bulletin. Originally, it was supposed to be a way for the people in the apartment buildings to organize and keep tabs on the landlords, with the goal of eventually forming some kind of tenants' union. But the board was completely overrun by crazies and whiners, people who accused their roommates of stealing trash, drunks rambling about nothing, racist tirades, and that sort of thing. I read the boards as a way of reminding myself that eventually, I'd be out of this hellhole. After I graduated, I could go anywhere. I believe I expected to see a post from my twin while I was ignoring my lecture. And sure enough, I saw the title, Altercation in the Coffee Shop, Read, Read, Read. I clicked on Read On. Beware this man, I finally met my twin stranger, I was excited, very rude, slapped coffee out of my hand. Why couldn't you just be friendly? Not every day you get to see someone who looked so much like you. Didn't get picture, but he looked identical to me, so here is a picture of myself for reference. It just went on like that. All caps, spelling mistakes and all. There was a selfie of him standing outside, looking even less like me than he did before. This was hilarious. Who did this idiot think he would reach with this? I thought about commenting and picking a fight with this guy, but I decided against it. It would be cruel to mess with someone with such an obvious mental problem. I cursed it up to click the back button, but something held me back. The selfie. He didn't look any different. Same dopey smile. Same child's haircut. He was wearing a yellow t-shirt. Most of his torso was cut off by the picture's lower border. I could tell the top of the t-shirt said 28th annual. I looked down at my shirt to confirm what I already knew. Upside down. I could read 28th annual Mendon County 5k. I clicked back to the post. The timestamp indicated the post had been made only seven minutes ago. That couldn't be enough time to... Wait, I had done it. I had run home soaked in coffee, changed, ran to school, opened my laptop and logged onto the forum. It stood to reason my doppelganger could do the same. I slammed my laptop shut. It was loud. Everyone in the class looked at me. Even the professor was quiet. I couldn't take it. I stood up and walked out the door. Okay, this had to be a coincidence. Lots of people have the same shirts. This guy couldn't be watching me. But I changed in the living room because I was in a rush. The blinds were open. The blinds were closed in my room, but I didn't change in there. 
I didn't change in there because I was in a rush. My apartment was on the first floor. Anyone could have seen me changing. Okay, this had to be a coincidence. I stopped. I had been walking back and forth down the hallway leading to the college cafeteria. I stood a moment to calm myself down and closed my eyes. My apartment is the bottom story of a townhouse. The bottom story of the townhouse next door is also an apartment. The room in that place closest to my house, separate from my living room, only by the alley with our garbage bins in it, is empty and used as storage. I know this because I had been to some parties at that house. I used to be pretty good friends with the woman who lived there. I remember that woman had moved out abruptly. I hadn't been friends with the roommates, so I'd never been back to the house after she was gone. I grabbed my phone and scrolled far, far back through the text, hoping that maybe I'd save the long message she had sent me when I asked where she'd been. I couldn't find it. I didn't really expect to. Her name wasn't even in my contacts anymore. All I could remember from the message is that she'd moved out because of the creepy new guy her other roommates had met on Craigslist and let move in. I couldn't recall any other details, but I knew, somehow I knew, that this had to be my twin. If he was staying in that room closest to my living room, and I hadn't noticed all this time, that meant he had no furniture. The room looked bare from my window. He had to be sleeping on a mat on the floor directly under the window, completely out of sight. Disgusting. Okay, I had to calm down. I was reading too far into this. But the image kept appearing in my mind. That man. That idiot. Squatting on a filthy mattress. Barely more than 20, 25 feet away from me ranting on a message board on his laptop with clothes, my clothes, strewn all over the floor. Disgusting. Maybe my imagination was running away from me, but I couldn't get away from that image. It felt like it had to be the truth. I knew I wouldn't be able to go back to the lecture. I was too anxious. I figured my best bet was to go home, smoke a bowl, and take a new kind of reality check. I took several deep breaths, cut through the cafeteria, left campus, and made my way toward home. I'll tell you why I decided to go to the house. It was because I was high. When I smoke, I get sociable, but in a very weird way. In fact, my friends at parties back in high school gave me the stone version of me a name, the peacemaker. I would insert myself into tense situations, or what I perceived to be tense situations, and try to resolve them diplomatically. I'd try to get drunk couples to stop arguing, I'd get between tough guys trying to show off. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it got me punched in the face. I was sitting there smoking and thinking about that house, and it seemed to me that maybe this was all just a big misunderstanding. I put myself in the mindset of a sad, possibly mentally challenged guy, living in little more than a walk-in closet, and I thought I'd want to be my friend too. I'd want to imitate me too. I mean, I'm a cool guy, right? I would walk over there and smooth things out. I'd tell him he was coming on a little strong, but it was cool. I'd help him develop his wardrobe. As I was walking to the blue front door of that house, I was writing a nice little classic corny college movie in my head. The peacekeeper helps Point Dexter get his stuff together and find a girlfriend. It was 2pm. I knocked on the door. No response. I did that thing that people do in the movies when there's no answer at the door, and I tried the knob. It was unlocked. I went in. I felt pretty stupid. The house was empty. No one was living there. The walls were painted that flat, inoffensive white that landlords like when a place isn't rented. The doormat was brand new. 
there was a faint smell of bleach. The place was the same general layout as my apartment, but with the featureless walls and lack of furniture, I felt like I was in a maze. I opened a door in the hallway, a pristine bathroom. None of those half full bottles of shampoo a shared bathroom always accumulates. I walked to the kitchen. Everything was brand new. There's something I don't like about a kitchen where the refrigerator isn't running. I was expecting kind of a comforting hum to break the silence of that house. The fact that it wasn't there made the silence even stronger. I opened the refrigerator door. The light didn't come on. There were dust particles in the beams of light from the window panes above the sink. There was a shrill, shrieking sound. I jumped about a foot in the air, but the sound stopped as soon as it started. I paused, then I realized. A smoke detector in one of the rooms was signaling it had a low battery. Even though I knew what it was now, I knew I would jump a mile when I heard that noise again. I decided to leave. Before I made it to the front door, I decided to check out the walk-in closet. I wanted to see just how much of my living room you could have seen from it. Now that I knew the creep couldn't be living here, I figured I'd probably been imagining how much you could have seen me from outside my house anyway. This was all just a case of my imagination, my paranoia running away from me. I figured out which of the doors in the hallway would be the room adjacent to the garbage bin alleyway and swung the door open. It must have been about an hour and a half later and I had called Ali seven times with no response. What can I say? I was panicking. We had broken up quite a long time ago but we were still close and she always picked up, always responded to my texts even if it was just to tell me she was busy and she would get back to me. I hung up after hearing the voicemail message for the eighth time. I was seriously considering calling the cops. But why could I possibly tell the cops? I'd snuck into a house on a whim. I had, purely by chance, in a room empty except for a filthy mattress, found a printout candid picture of my ex-girlfriend. I believed, without any evidence, that this room belonged to a random guy who creeped on me. I definitely look like the crazy one here. Officer, you don't get it. He posted about me online. I got out my laptop, logged onto Facebook, and found Ali's profile. This was a dead end. She was not an active Facebook user. Her last status had been made two months ago. But I looked closely at the selfie. I realized something. I could tell exactly where in the city she had taken it. I walk everywhere, and I know hundreds of odd little landmarks, and I could tell where she had been to take that selfie, because I recognized the fence she was standing in front of. It was a bizarre fence that enclosed one of the big houses in the nice part of town. Its posts were topped with little statuses of dashens. I was inspired. I went back to the neighbor bulletin and clicked on altercation in the coffee shop read read read. There he was, with his dumb grin and my t-shirt. I could see, over his right shoulder, a low concrete wall with heavy graffiti, and behind the wall, obscuring part of the tree line, a blue birdhouse with a barber pole striped roof. I knew the city so freaking well. McCabe Park. I could have walked to that grubby little park with my eyes closed. I hopped on my bike. It was after five. It was the golden hour. I felt like I was in a movie. As I sped through neighborhoods on my bike, I saw the city in brief impressions and moments. A pigeon perched on a don't walk sign. A homeless man with a saxophone. I couldn't believe it was me who was living through this. It was like I was watching everything I did through binoculars. I rounded the corner of Smith Street and Gollum and parked my bike at the entrance of McCabe Park. 
there was a plume of thick smoke emerging from behind the trees in the stripy birdhouse. I walked through the overgrown park in the direction of the source of the smoke. It stank. The stench was almost unbearable. How had nobody called the cops to investigate this stench? The apartment buildings across the street from the park was abandoned, and the street was bordered mostly by businesses that would have been closed by that time of day. I suppose the residents of the few townhouses near the park simply didn't care. The stench was hard to describe. When I was very small, I tried to cook a whole pack of hot dogs in the microwave. I left the thing running for 15 minutes until the hot dogs charred and the plastic melted. The smell was like a thousand times more intense version of that charred, chemical smell. It got stronger as I approached the southern corner of the park. I had to push through some brush before I was able to see what was going on. There was a big pile of tires in a mound that leaned against the wall that formed the corner of the park. Evidently, people had been dumping garbage there where the trees were thickest and no one would notice. Some of the tires had been stacked into a little tower that leaned back into the bigger mound and these were the ones smoldering and emanating that terrible stench. There were some empty gas cans scattered around. No, it wasn't really a stack of smoldering tires. The tires weren't plumbed to each other, they were shoved onto something that kept them together. I stepped closer. Sticking out of the gap in the tires was a blackened human arm. Hey buddy, what are you doing here? I turned around. My twin wasn't wearing one of my outfits anymore. He was naked. If I hadn't been looking for a fight, I wouldn't have had to bear witness to any of this. If I had ignored the creepy man in the coffee shop, if I had minded my business and gone to class, I could have let the cops find the tire fire. It's true I would have been heartbroken, maybe even devastated, to find out what happened to my ex-girlfriend. But I never would have connected a naked lunatic with a crazy guy who tried to make friends over coffee. It was my need for a fight, some sort of confrontation that turned a lurid newspaper clipping into something I have to see a counsellor about now. What can I tell you about the chase? It probably lasted less than a minute. I ran away from the naked man who yelled and raved at me. I wove through an overgrown park as the sun was going down. When I jumped into traffic, a guy in a pickup truck swerved and swore at me, but I made it to the other side. To be honest, I wasn't even sure if the man was following me all the way until I heard the truck's brake squeal. The truck driver, who was remarkably calm for a guy who had just crushed a human being, made me wait for the cops with him. He seemed to think I had something to do with this. I told the cops I had seen the smoke and smelled the smell, and I had run away when I saw the naked man. Why complicate things? They didn't need to know about the house and the message board and the coffee shop. When they let me go, I took a long, circuitous route home. I knew I wouldn't be able to sleep, and I wanted to delay having to face that for as long as I could. I made my way to another park, a better kept one where they trim the trees and don't let people dump garbage, and I sat down on a clean bench. I wish I could have sat there until the sun rose.